Life is starting to get back into its regular routine, more people getting back to work, the kids are back to camp. Starting next week, I'm going to try to limit these press conferences to one day a week, Wednesdays at one o'clock. So be, I'm here today, obviously Friday, but starting next week, we're gonna go with a cadence of every Wednesday, one o'clock. I'm sure there are gonna be weeks where we can't fit everything into one day, particularly as we get closer to school coming back. I expect I'll have to do a couple of days a week, um, but on a steady state for the next month or so, Wednesdays, one o'clock, I would ask you to tune in if you can. We're gonna to try to put a lot of news and information into that one session on Wednesdays. Also, if you, since we're only down to a day a week and since it's harder and harder for people to tune in, I would strongly urge you, ask you please to consider getting the daily email update on COVID news. You can go to the governor's website and sign up for the daily email, governor.ri.gov governor.ri.gov. It's just information on a daily basis to uh, about how Rhode Island's doing with the virus, updates you need, updates about businesses, and it's an opportunity for us to interact even though we'll be having fewer press conferences. Um, I, I would also say it's a great way for me to hear from you. Uh, it's an opportunity for folks to um, send in ideas and last week I we had a fun exchange around masks and some of you sent in some incredibly creative ideas for masks so it's it's a good way for us to stay in touch as we work together through the COVID crisis. So today we're going to begin with the data as we always do I'd ask you to please put it up on the screen as you can see from the slide on your screen today we have another 45 new cases um, and very sadly, another two deaths. Uh, I can't wait for the day that we don't have deaths to report, and it's a constant reminder, people are dying every single day. We're up to almost a 1,000 lost lives here in the state of Rhode Island. So I'm asking you please to keep them in your thoughts and prayers and use that as a reminder to yourselves to do the simple things that are required to keep our friends and neighbors safe, healthy, and alive. Wear your masks, be socially distant, wash your hands, um, and above all, stay at home if you're sick. Because we continue to lose lives every day and the toll that this virus has taken is devastating. Um, and it's on every one of us, shared responsibility, to look out for a neighbor and do the right thing. Okay, today I have a few topics I'd like to cover. I want to begin by taking a minute to talk about the data. Um, from the beginning of this, dealing with the crisis, there's been a lot of discussion about data. And we, we look at the data constantly to figure out where are we, where are we going, uh, what would it look like if things got bad. Obviously, we're looking all over the country and other states, all over the world and other countries. And um, so today I wanted to take a minute to talk, to talk about the data. I would say the good news is that as you can see, um, and as you hear every time I'm up here, Rhode Island is in a good place. The trends of decreased hospitalizations, decreased number of cases, low and steady percent positive are all excellent. In fact, Rhode Island is one of very few states that are seeing declines. We're standing out in that regard, that we're seeing declines, um, <coughs> whereas many of other states are seeing increases. There are many, many reasons for that. We've been more aggressive at contact tracing, testing, we've acted early in shutting schools, prohibiting gatherings, and, and et cetera. I would say, above all, the reason Rhode Island is doing as well as we're doing is because of the people of Rhode Island. When we asked businesses to shut down, they did. When we asked you to work from home, you did. We asked you to wear your masks, by and large, people are. Folks are staying home when they're sick, people are keeping social distance. It's working. I know it's hard, but be proud of yourselves. Just look at the facts. It is working. It is the reason we're able to go back to school, back to camp, open daycare, back to the beach, back to work, 
and I'm just asking you to stick with us. Now, I'd ask you to put another slide up on the screen, please. It's, it's gonna, it shows where we've been and where we are. So you'll see on the screen a blue line which shows the trends in hospitalization since the middle of March. And you can see in that blue line, that's our actual experience. It shows a steady, consistent decline in hospitalizations since our peak at the end of April. Remember, we keep our eye firmly on hospitalizations because that's a fact. Um, number of cases, it depends on how, you know, that, that can vary, it depends on how many people you test, testing, you know, metrics vary. Hospitalizations are a, it's a fact, it's known, and it's uh, undisputed, and so the fact that our hospitalizations have been in steady decline is a good thing. You'll also see two paths of what next month could look like. If we continue to do what we're doing, social distancing, mask wearing, keeping your social circle small, social gatherings 25 or fewer, then I expect we'll continue on the blue line that you see in front of you. That's my expectation. If you were to say, Governor, what do you think? I think I have confidence, I'm leading with confidence, my, putting my faith in Rhode Island, I expect the blue line. Uh, however, if we start to relax and don't wear masks, bunch up at the beach, crowd into bars, take a risk and go to work when we feel sick, then our rate of spread will increase. We could start to look very much like many other states and we think, we've done certain assumptions, we'll very likely end up on the yellow line that's on your screen and possibly much higher. If that were to happen, then I have to go back and impose restrictions. Why do we put this up? Because this is what we, you know, this is what we do all day, the what if scenarios. And there, there are assumptions, of course, behind all of these scenarios and behind the yellow line. But the reality is that it's kind of a formula. You know, we now know less mask wearing, more congregating, leads to a higher rate of infection, leads to more hospitalizations and more cases. And so that yellow line is our attempt to share what we think might happen if in the next few weeks people stop following the rules. So um, let's stick to the blue line. That's what I'm asking the people of Rhode Island. Let's stick to the blue line, let's beat the blue line. And by the way, it's, it's simple, simple steps. It's the, the, the most maddening thing about this virus, as deadly as it is, and as sophisticated as our approach to it is, with technology and such, it's actually pretty simple. Stay out of big groups, stay home if you're sick, keep a social distance, and wear your masks. If we do that, we're gonna hit the blue line and I feel that we'll continue to be in good shape and we'll be able to open the economy further instead of turning the dial back, as we're seeing happening all over the country, frankly, all over the world. Um, a note on beaches before I continue. Obviously, the weekend is coming up, it's July, beaches are on everybody's mind. Uh, it's great to go to the beach. It's a wonderful thing to do. I hope you do it. I hope you enjoy it. I want to keep the beaches open. Um, yesterday was a hot day. It was a hot, hot, muggy day. It was a great day to be at the beach. We did have some troubles at our beaches, though. And in particular, I want to call out Musquamacate Beach. Uh, we just saw too much crowding. Now, it was high tide. We all know, we're Rhode Islanders, we know what high tide means at the beach. It means there's less sand, and we all move our blankets up and we squish together. But during the COVID situation, we can't do that. Um, so we, we saw a lot of people piling into cars, eight, 10 people in a car, flooding onto the beach, really close together, 
crowds at pavilions, crowds in line, not good mask wearing. So I would just say, you know, please make good choices. If you're going to go to the beach, keep your crowd small. If you go to the beach, it's high tide and it's massively crowded, I'd ask you to think about leaving and coming back later. Um, and if you do go to the beach and you do go to the bathroom or go to the pavilion or go get a snack, please put your mask on. So have fun, go to the beach, but be smart about it. Keep your cr crowd small and tr just try to keep a distance. And if it's high tide, have some patience and maybe come back later. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, would you ever close the beaches? Because we're seeing other governors having to close the beaches. The answer is, of course I would, but I don't want to. I love the beach. I go to the public beach all the time. I don't want to do it. I don't think we should have to do it. So let's just try harder to follow the rules, and I think we should be able to keep the beaches open. Okay. Um, I want to talk for a minute about housing. I have said a few times at this press event, these press conferences, that I, I would be back with some more um, solutions around helping people who are struggling with, with their housing. I would say, uh, as I have said so many times, the, the public health crisis of COVID has led to an economic crisis. And we know that. Unemployment is at historic highs. People are out of work. Anybody who went into the COVID crisis, housing insecure, with low income, unemployed, is really struggling now. Thankfully, we haven't seen um, a, a massive spike in evictions. We haven't, you know, we're in touch constantly with the courts. You know, at this point, uh, we know there's a great deal of suffering and struggling tenants, but we haven't yet seen a massive spike in evictions. Um, I am worried, though, that as the $600 benefit from the federal government ends in the end of July, and as the economic crisis drags on, that this is a problem that's going to get worse before it gets better. And I am also so deeply sympathetic to people who are struggling to meet their most basic needs, food, shelter, you know, gas in the car. So um, to that end, I, I would like to share with you a new initiative that I'm rolling out now and that will get started next week to help people avoid eviction. Uh, as I mentioned a week or two ago, we've been working with the United Way and the Rhode Island Judiciary um, to address the eviction problem as courts have moved back into operations. Obviously, we haven't seen a lot of evictions because the courts were closed for a long time. So today I'm very pleased to announce that in that coordination with the Rhode Island District Court, which is the court that handles evictions, and the United Way, uh, next week, we will be launching an eviction diversion effort that we're calling the Safe Harbor Housing Program. And this, it is my hope that this initiative will serve as an alternative to a traditional eviction process and will provide landlords and tenants an opportunity to work towards a solution outside of the court system to avoid evictions. Uh, we'll be directing $7 million of our CARES Act funding to this effort, and we expect that that, that, that $7 million will be able to support at least 1,000 folks, probably closer to 1,500 or 2,000 Rhode Islanders, so that they can maintain stable housing. And once again, I want to thank Rhode Island's federal delegation for working so hard to secure the uh, CARES Act funding, um, especially Senator Reid, who's been a vocal decades-long advocate for affordable housing. It's, it's because of that that we're able to put forth this new $7 million eviction diversion initiative. So let me explain how it will work. Renters, so there's an application process, and that's going to start next week. Renters who meet income criteria so you have to have an income below a certain threshold, and are behind on their rent because of a 
COVID-19. Maybe you lost your job uh, because of COVID or you're out of work temporarily because of COVID. You can qualify for assistance. You tenants can apply directly or landlords can apply on behalf of tenants who need help paying the rent. So let me be clear, this is for folks who um, are in arrears. Their rent is past due. Their, their rent is past due. Um, they've, e they've either received an eviction notice, they've been on notice that they're going to be evicted, the process has already started. Um, it's for folks who are in danger of being evicted because they've lost, rev lost uh, income on account of COVID. Starting Monday, if you're in that category, you can contact the United Way and ask about the Safe Harbor program and go ahead and apply for an application. Easiest way is to call 211. Call 211, United Way, and ask about the Safe Harbor program. Or if you can't remember the name of that, I have trouble remembering the names of all of these new initiatives, just say, I'm about to get evicted, I need help, can you help me work on a payment plan with my landlord and we'll get you into this program. The, it, both parties have to agree to participate. No one's going to be forced to do this. So the tenant has to agree and the landlord has to agree. If both parties agree, they'll be contacted by a United Way housing specialist to finalize a payment agreement. And then the payment agreement, that's will be supported by the $7 million of the federal money, will help you pay your rent for a period of time. Um, tenants who are in need of legal advice will be able to access free legal services. So I suspect most landlords will be represented by a lawyer and we want to make sure every tenant also has the opportunity to be represented by a lawyer for free. To be clear, again, you can apply to participate before you receive an eviction notice. If you, if you think you're on the verge of being evicted because you know you're not going to be able to catch up on the rent that you already owe. The whole point of this is we want to resolve these issues before an eviction. That's why it's eviction diversion. We want to see um, if we can get the parties to the table to come up with some kind of a mediated settlement, put the tenant on a you know, multi-month payment plan. It's good for the landlord because it keeps the tenant there and they continue to pay rent. And obviously it's good for the tenant because we don't want anybody to be homeless or evicted during this time of need. Um, so I hope that this is, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. I want to say this, um, it is, obvious that $7 million, although it may keep 1,000 or 2,000 families in their homes, is not going to solve the whole problem. I know that, and I'm not pretending that it will. But I also know that there's families struggling right now, and, it's not, and we got to help them. We have to help them right now to not be evicted. No one should have to live homeless ever. No one should be homeless ever, but particularly now, we want to be there. So this is an immediate action step to prevent eviction to make sure folks stay in their home. As I said earlier, I expect that when the $600 goes away, as this unemployment situation drags on, as the courts are open for, for evictions, we're going to get a better picture of how big the housing problem is and we're going to come back and we're going to continue to address it. But this is meant to, to immediately provide relief to our most vulnerable families and, and be there for them so they don't wind up homeless. I will also say a permanent solution is almost certainly going to require legislation. I have been asked a few times, you know, to do an executive order stopping evictions. Um, apart from the fact that I'm not sure I can do that, uh, I, this is a, a long-term issue, providing enough sustainable, affordable housing we need a proper long-term solution and I look forward to working with the legislature to do that. Um, and uh, with the district court. District court, by the way, I have to say thank you to the court and thank you to the United Way. Both have been fantastic partners. This is hard to do. This is a unique program. It's hard to do. We're trying to be creative. So hats off to the court and to the United Way. 
Um, as we go forward, I would love to see a more permanent diversion program, mediation program at the district court to continue something like this um, forever. And as I've said many times, I implore the General Assembly to, pro to pass a law prohibiting discrimination based on source of income. It's wrong. If people have an ability to pay the rent, they shouldn't be discriminated against based upon where that money comes from, even if that money is a voucher from the federal government. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm very pleased to say starting Monday that'll be up and running. Call the United Way. As I said a couple of days ago, next week I plan to talk more about small business relief. That's a, a plan. I plan to address that next Wednesday. That'll be in a similar vein, which is to say the challenges facing our small businesses are, are massive and uh, what we're able to roll out in a week or so is meant to provide immediate relief but not to me it, it's not going to solve our entire economic crisis for the long term. That's the hard work that we all have to engage in, including the legislature, including the Congress, in um, the months to come. But next week I'll be back with some more de with details around short-term, immediate steps that we're going to start to take to put money in the pockets of small businesses as quickly as we can to help them deal with the the same thing, paying the rent, buying the plexiglass, keeping the doors open, because we, we want to do everything we can to be there for people in the moment as they're struggling. And I know everyone is struggling. I do, I hear it, and I'm doing my best to do everything we can using all the tools at our disposal to be there for you so you're not alone and we give you a hand to get through it. And we are going to continue to do that. Okay, a couple more things. <clears throat> Today, I'm, I'm very excited to announce version two of our Crush COVID RI app is now available for download at the um, Apple Store and Google Play. So download it, please. Take uh, 30 seconds later today, um, tomorrow. It's going to be a rainy weekend, so it's a good day to like catch up on things. Download the new app at the Apple Store or on Google Play. Um, I use this app, I think it's great, and I plan to download the new one. I want to give a huge shout out to Shirag Patel and his team. They're the guys who've been working full time, state employees, to bring the app live and make it even better. I also want to thank Infosys, which is a company that has a local presence here. They've given us a lot of free uh, help, tech help to get this app up and running. Um, I would say that the building of the app and putting out this version two is a process that typically would take months. They've done it in weeks and it's great. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic tool to help all of us stay safe. Uh, and so I want to give a big thank you to the team. So let me, give me a second to sh share with you the changes that we've made with the app. I will say thank you. We have over 60,000 Rhode Islanders who have already downloaded the app and are using it. I love to see us at 100,000. Um, this, listen, as these press conferences go from three days a week to two days a week to one day a week, as we get busy in our lives, we have to find quick, easy ways to stay informed. This app is, I think, the easiest way to do it. Just, it's, it's like how we live our lives. Put it on your phone, check it once a day. Um, it's, it's the quickest, easiest way to stay safe. The changes that I'm about to explain have all been your ideas. So 60,000 people have been using it. We've been soliciting feedback, doing testing. And you've said to us, could you do this? Could you do that? So we've tried to respond. First, we've heard from a lot of Rhode Islanders that being able to take notes in the location diary would be very helpful. So uh, now you can do that in the second version of the app. So under each address in your location diary, you can clarify where you were. So instead of it just saying the address, you can jot down you were at a friend's house, you were at CBS, you were at wherever you were at, and you can leave a note who you were with. 
Um, I, I love this because I often forget who we were with. So I was at so-and-so's house. I was with these people. Put it right there in the app. For months, I've been asking you to keep your contact tracing journal. This makes that even easier because you can do it right at the time that you're at where you are. Uh, the, I cannot emphasize enough. I'm, I'm begging you to please download this and use this. This will make the job of our contact tracers so much easier and they will be so much more effective. Uh, this morning I spent the whole morning working with the team thinking about school. How are we going to get the kids back to school safely? Pretty soon, think about what our lives are going to look like, hopefully. Mostly everyone will be back to work, our children will be back to school, our, our lives will be very busy, we'll be being with many more people in a day and in many more locations. The only way we're going to be able to do that safely is if we double down on our efforts to keep ourselves safe. More mask wearing, more hand washing, more social distancing, and more use of the Crush COVID app for the location diary and the contact tracing uh, and the location diary and the contact tracing notebook. Because if you get sick, you're going to get a call from the Department of Health. And if you can pull up this app and quickly tell them, I've been in 15 locations and talked to these 30 people, we can do our work quickly. If you don't, it'll take us days to do that work, which means you and everyone you've been in contact with is going to be in quarantine for a long time. So this, I cannot emphasize enough how vital contact tracing is and is going to be, and I'm asking you to invest in taking the time to download this app and use it. Uh, secondly, symptom diary, instead of just tracking your symptoms and submitting them to the Department of Health daily, you'll now be able to see a record of your symptoms for the last 20 days. Um, people have asked us that for functionality. So this also will help during a case investigation. If you're asked, when did you start showing symptoms? If you're like me, you can't remember, you're busy, go to your app and it will have a log of symptoms for 20 days. You can see, oh, six days ago I started to feel sick. This is consistent with our overall approach to the virus. Testing. Um, in the app, we've included a testing map so you can easily see where the nearest testing location is and be provided information about our asymptomatic testing program. So again, this is very important. We're changing the way we do testing. A month ago, we had the, the big operation at Twin River. Now we don't. Now we have more testing centers. We're rolling out. We're going to have more and different testing when school comes back, more and different testing as we go forward. The best way to keep yourselves informed is download the app. There's a new testing map, and it will be constantly updated. So that's your quickest, best, most accurate source of information. Where do I get tested? We've also added um, an additional link uh, for resources for Rhode Islanders to get help. Um, it's confusing. I, I find myself confusing. I come up here and I say we have these two initiatives for housing, this initiative for undocumented immigrants, this initiative for small businesses. It can be dizzying. So if you download the app, that we've enabled a place for you to have all the resources in an easy place in an effort to make your lives easier and less stressful because I know this is a stressful time. And then finally, we've beefed up the frequently asked questions portion of the app. Because um, again, I know this is an anxious time. It's anxious, it's uncertain. You put the news on, you see what's happening in other parts of the country, it's scary. So I'm, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say this is kind of a one-stop place to go. And hopefully you'll get the information you need so you can um, breathe a sigh of relief and take care of your families. Last thing is, the initial app was launched in English and Spanish. We've had a lot of requests for Portuguese, so version 2 coming out today will also be in Portuguese. Uh, I hope you download it, I hope you like the uh, changes, and I hope you join me in thanking the tech team for uh, working hard under difficult circumstances to put that forth. I do want to say one final thing about um, 
about the app, which is although we've changed it, it's available in Portuguese, it's got new functionality, what hasn't changed is our commitment to privacy. So I just want to take a minute, because we still hear this a lot, to remind you of a few things. All of the information that you put in your app stays on your phone. No one has access to that. Not us, not the Department of Health, not Infosys, no one. It's on, it lives on your phone and it is never attached to your name. No one is following you, no one has access to your contacts. It's information that lives on your phone. It's for you to use to manage your lives safely. If you get sick, if you get tested positive, you're going to get a call from someone at the Department of Health. They will ask you if you'd be willing to share your location diary. You could say no, and they'll never have it. You could read it to them over the phone. By the way, that's a perfectly excellent way to use the app. You pull it up and you tell them, these are all the places I've been and all the people I've been in contact with. Or you could say, yes, I will upload it. If you do that, your information, not your name, goes for a temporary period of time to the Department of Health so they can use it for a limited period of time strictly for contact tracing purposes. Um, and everything is deleted from your phone automatically in 20 days. So I uh, just, I know people feel uneasy about the privacy and I just again wanted to say I'm using this, my family's using it, my staff and friends are using it. It's a hugely important tool and if you, if it's more important as we go forward and I would ask you to give it a try, just try it. Try it for two weeks. If you feel uncomfortable, fine, undo it. But I'd like everyone to give it a try. We're at 60,000 now, I'd like to be to 70,000 downloads in a week or two. Let's get ourselves to 100,000. Um, and that would that'd be pretty amazing if we could do that.